Welcome back to Succeed with Dyslexia. Here we discuss news and topics that go on in the dyslexia community. So make sure you like this video, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our future videos. Here are the topics that we're gonna cover in this episode. We'll hear from our friend Julia and how using art can improve the self-esteem of students with dyslexia. During the month of May, Succeed with Dyslexia is raising awareness for dyslexia and mental health. Following this, we'll be joined by Aaron Smith and how he's helping to spread global dyslexia awareness. We'll showcase what went on during our Drop Everything and Read campaign. Cassandra tells us about her journey being a tutor for individuals with neurodiversities and some of the things that she's learned along the way. We also want to tell you of a very special event that we have coming up. On May 11th for Mental Health Awareness Week, Kirsty Heap will join us to answer your questions surrounding dyslexia and mental health. Who is Kirsty Heap? A dyslexic confidence and mindset coach who works with dyslexic managers and leaders to help them reach their full potential and understand how to make their strengths work for them. This Facebook Live focuses on building confidence in people with literacy differences. Stay tuned for a live Q&A on building confidence in people who have dyslexia, complete with hints, tips, and tricks that can help. Hello, and you're back for another Succeed with Dyslexia interview, and we have another incredible guest joining us today. Uh, my name is Darren Clark, and I'm the Managing Director of Succeed with Dyslexia. We're a global organization that is spreading the awareness for dyslexia on a global scale, and we do these interviews to hear from the voices of incredible people, and we have another incredible guest with us today. Juliet, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, tell us your name. That would be a good start, and a little bit about yourself. That would be amazing. And ultimately, thank you so much for taking time out of your day for us. Yes, thank you for having me. So my name is Julia de Montagnac. I'm a junior in high school in America on the East Coast, and I am the creator of the Color and Confidence program. So I'm a Girl Scout, and for my Girl Scout Goal to Work project, which is the highest level award you could get as a Girl Scout, I created a program for students with dyslexia. And so in my hometown, I work with three school districts and I work with third and fourth graders who have dyslexia. And we do something called art integration, which is basically integrating arts into learning. So you could do any form of the arts, but I love art, um, specifically visual arts. So I am doing visual arts with the students that I work with. And then I have an online component called coloringconfidence.com, where I post all of my projects and information about mis dyslexia and the neuroscience behind dyslexia because I'm hoping to go into medicine and I love neuroscience. And on that, that website is for everyone internationally, no matter what age group you're in. And I hope that the instructions on the website, they're easily adjustable for different age groups outside of that third and fourth grade range. Wonderful. Julia, you, it's incredible to have you here. You've done so much in such, such a, a small amount of time in comparison to some of the things that we're doing. There's so much to unpack with, with what you <laughs> Juliet, um, firstly, congratulations on the incredible achievements. And, and ultimately, what's your relationship with, with dyslexia? So I don't have dyslexia or any other language-based learning disability. However, when I was in about second grade, I struggled with reading. And the struggle was significant enough to the point where I had to be put into a specialized reading class. And I eventually graduated out of this class and language arts is now my favorite subject. So, um, but in that specialized reading class, I just kind of lost my confidence in an academic setting because being taken out of the normal class and put in a specialized reading class, it's hard, especially at that age group when it's a formidable years. So I had a taste of what it was like to have a reading disability or a learning disability and having to be put into a specialized class, even though I didn't have to do this for many years, I only had to do it for one year, but I'm super empathetic to those who have to be put in the specialized class for many, many years, or maybe their entire academic life. And it's hard, especially to retain your confidence while being put into these class and told that you don't fit the normal model of where you should be. And so I wanted to create this program also because like I said before, I love art and art and dyslexia connects in so many ways. And I thought it's so amazing to show students with dyslexia that their confidence shouldn't be deteriorated and they shouldn't feel like 
they are less than the normal and through art they could express themselves and they could use art as a tool through our integration to learn and help themselves in their struggle with reading and their language arts and history classes absolutely and thank you for sharing that and and and, and you touched on the, the fact of you know the confidence and uh, and we we know you know confidence it, when you kind of leave you know your uh, we call it the primary school uh, in 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 the uk and you go to secondary school which I, I guess would be high school the 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 confidence element kind of almost gets sort of knocked out you in a, you know in a certain uh, a certain way in the sense of maybe some of the lessons that you go into you're not getting the grades that you you know you require and, and there's a lot of peer pressure in there how how, how big is confidence to play in the, a, a part within within what you what you're doing and the students that we were around were you noticing that their confidence was very, very kind of low and it was just trying to find a way of of, of bringing that out I think confidence is so significant in all aspects of your life, but especially in academics, because you're in school from such a young age. And like you said, with grades, I mean, I don't necessarily think that grades are a good measure of someone's academic or educational ability. And you might not be able to excel in an academic setting because maybe you're not the best studier. Maybe you're just not able to take notes well, but that doesn't indicate that you're not a smart person. But when you aren't getting those amazing grades that are reflecting this academic ability, it's hard to be confident with your educational ability. And I think confidence is just such a pivotal part of our lives to go for what you want to do. You have to be confident in some sort of way. And with the students that I'm working with in person, I work with third and fourth graders, like I said, and I love working with third and fourth grade because I think those are like the formative years where in here in America, they're moving up from fifth grade. And then in sixth grade at most schools, you go to middle school. So they're kind of like getting older and trying to find themselves. And in that, their confidence is really developing. And with the students that I've worked with, there are all varying levels of confidence that they have. But I have found that while they're doing art, all their confidence kind of levels out and they're all able to express themselves and be happy and confident and feel like amazing artists. And I hope that they can translate that confidence that they are learning through this art integration into other aspects of their lives. And especially when school gets more rigorous to see that even though maybe you're not getting the A on every single paper, that shouldn't deteriorate your confidence in your educational ability. We are now very excited to touch on our new campaign, Dyslexia and Me. This spring, Succeed with Dyslexia are renewing our focus on dyslexia and mental health in our new campaign, Dyslexia and Me. Throughout the month of May, we'll be focusing on creating content, resources, and a social media wave about how people with dyslexia experience mental health, exploring difficulties that dyslexic people might have accessing mental health support, and drive awareness and visibility to our global dyslexia community. We want to support and empower people with dyslexia in their mental health journeys, and we'd love for you to be a part of that story with us. Follow us on all of our social media channels for more information. We'll now be joined by our very own Darren Clark and his conversation with Aaron Smith and what Aaron is doing to spread awareness about dyslexia. Hello and welcome to another Succeed with Dyslexia interview. We have another incredible guest, a great friend of mine. Without further ado, Aaron, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, start with your name, that'd be great. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks very much, Darren. So I'm Aaron Smith. Uh, I am a severely dyslexic adult. I'm 37 years old. I have to keep remembering this because I'm very close to the, my next birthday and I always forget to remember what age I am. So I'm at the moment 37 and I class myself as a severely dyslexic adult. So I have a reading age of a nine-year-old, spelling age of an eight-year-old. I have no automatic reading capabilities. I also have tendencies of ADHD, ASD and dyspraxia. Now I have got a cup of tea, Darren, so hopefully I won't knock it over like I normally do in these kind of things. So we hopefully won't have to stop the recording at all for, uh, for me having to mop up stuff because of my dyspraxia. Honestly, Aaron, that, that, I, firstly, I want to say a massive thank you for taking time out of your incredibly, incredibly busy schedule uh, to speak with us uh, at, at Succeed. Aaron, with regards to, I mean, there's so much we can kind of dive into with, with that. If we kind of took, you know, kind of the diagnosis sign of it, um, yep. how did that kind of look for you? And what kind so, of age and what was that journey yeah. looking like? So I was diagnosed at age nine and uh, I was diagnosed by 
it was kind of a twofold concept. So my mom has been was saying from probably the age of six that there's something not right. I remember her telling me that my second, my my year two teacher didn't believe in anything like it, like dyslexia. Uh, my year three teacher that I had a, I, I remember year three quite well because I had two teachers, one I really liked and one I didn't like because they were like a job share, and that was. Um, they didn't understand me either. But it, when I was in year four, we had an NQT, newly qualified teacher, and she was the one that kind of really started this concept. But as well, my mum and dad decided to take me to Dyslexia Institute, which was called Dyslexia Action, which is unfortunately no longer with us anymore. Uh, here in Leicester, they had a, they had a centre in Leicester. And I was diagnosed by an educational psychologist, and I was told I was dyslexic. Uh, and But since then, I think I've had now about six diagnosis or because what happens is is specialist teachers or ed science go we have this new test aaron do you mind if we test it on you and i'm going yeah why not um but you know it was it was interesting i remember my mom telling me i was dyslexic and i had this kind of revelation it's like oh this is why this is what it is and this is quite amazing to me and i think that i found really beneficial but but then on the flip side of it i then realized okay this is why my sister, who's three years younger, me can read best than me. This is why I'm being picked on at school for not knowing one times one is. This is why I I don't have friends. I'm I'm I can't can't play sport. I I'm kind of not. I'm I'm relating to older people rather than young or younger people rather than people my own age. Uh, and I kind of use the analogy that dyslexia is like going to the dentist. And now I had I had. I had eight teeth taken out when I was younger over, over a period of five years. So I hate the dentist massively. Um, even now it's the anxiety is too much sometimes. Um, but actually that is how I thought dyslexia was then. And, and, and yeah, I was, I was very depressed. Uh, I didn't actually realize until me and my mom have had lots of conversations about this, that actually how worried she was about me uh, because the concept of things like mental health, like, like in the past, in the past five years, it's become more, uh, okay to talk about it. It wasn't 10 years, 15 years ago when I was diagnosed. Um, but it was, it was fascinating. It was, I, I got given a book and the book is called, so you think you, so uh, you, you think you have a problem. And uh, it's a book that I've, I, I recommend to any dyslexic to read, especially young dyslexic, because the first page, and I kind of memorized the opening, it says, many, many books have been written for your mom and dad. I thought it was high time I wrote one for yourself. Wow. Um, and that explained kind of the bits of dyslexia. that were. It was really amazing to read. Uh, and big font, big A4 booklet. So it wasn't too hard. On some pages, there was just too much text, and I didn't read it. But the majority of that started me understanding what dyslexia was. And actually, then now I go, actually – when I talk to parents or talk to young people, I always say to them, understand your dyslexia, understand your strengths, understand your differences, understand your difficulties. Because if you can get a grasp of all of them, you then can then start supporting yourself and moving forward. Absolutely. And and if I could just thank you so much again for, for sharing that, Aaron. And with regards to that, that book, that must have been, you know, that really kind of struck a chord with me because there, there is so much when we talk about dyslexia, we always talk about the person that's assisting the person. So we also maybe the, you know, the parent and the teacher. And it's very it's sometimes that the actual person with dyslexia is kind of it, it feels sometimes that no one's actually speaking directly mm, to them. Yeah. It's almost a, a case of how can we help? How can we support in a, in a really great way? Don't get me wrong. But, but that must have resonated really, you know, for the first time someone's I, actually speaking to me. I, I, the thing is, I remember it. I remember it. And yes, I referenced the book a lot. So I kind of now I reference it more than I ever did. But I remember it because actually that teacher and it's one of these things that when you when you when we talk about a dyslexia show, it's one of the things that I've been trying to find and I, I can't find is that teacher to come to the show now. Another teacher we can, but when we talk about later in school, and I'll talk about I'll talk about uh, my Senko in my upper school, but she is coming to the dyslexia show as a, as, a, as my guest uh, because that's a different change. But you're right, that book I remember it, and I remember it, I remember it's, it's got a yellow background, and I, the the other thing I remember is is that it had a spiral bound because it was A4 with a spiral bound, and not many books were like that. Normally, um, like kind of resource books were like that not this kind of, and, and, yeah 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 and that's thing so that's how i remember it so you know it was definitely interesting and it was also interesting that that teacher uh said that i was dyslexic and she used that word now it was never used after that 
Wow. So the word dyslexia, I was never I, up until up until I started until I started in year ten doing my GCSEs. The word dyslexia was never mentioned at school. It was mentioned at home. It was mentioned with my mum and dad. They'd taken me to the Leicestershire Dyslexia Association, which uh, is an independent charity affiliated to the British Dyslexia Association um, that ran an after-school workshop, which still runs an after-school workshop today. Uh, and um, but going there when I was nine, I'm now chairman of that group as well. It's just another thing that I do. Um, and a uh, small local charity that, that, that we, we've had up to 30 children every Saturday morning have lessons. But that... Um, Having have going there and being and using the word dyslexia kind of then resonated with me, but yeah, no, it was it, yeah having having her name was Miss Hughes and I always remember it because luckily for me she was also my year six teacher, so year five I had the deputy head as my teacher and we never saw him, uh, uh, and and the uh, and my year six we had Miss Hughes again and. Um, uh, about halfway through uh, like this term actually this so, so theoretically this time I had enough. Uh, I had enough with all the bully and I had enough with that. And I said to her, I don't, I don't want to come to school anymore. And literally she, she said, go to the place, which I don't like, which is the library, go to the library, uh, which I went to. I don't like the library, but I went there. Uh, and she, and basically I had seven people come in and apologize to me wow. as I walked back into the classroom uh, because people were like, they understood me. And that thing it is. And it's, it is. There's some things you remember from primary school. And that that was one thing. The other thing was the was the spe- the Senko room or the special needs room, uh, which was the room that had all the furniture from the from the Victorian time. I was the best way to describe it. It's all massive old furniture, loads of drawers, and I don't know if you if you remember Darren, like the pin boards were all furry that yeah. you used to have in schools. Yeah. So that was the tabletop. And and it's the, this is the weirdest thing to tell anyone, but it is weird because this is how things like sensory overload really affects you. That was what we would use to write on. Now it was horrible to write, horrible to touch, and I still I still get a, a feeling of of stress when I feel it. But the only way I could relieve that kind of anxiety was to lick it. Really? That is a weird thing to say, nice. and that meant now that uh, it, it kind of when I say it, the anxiety part of it and that feeling approach, that kind of overstimulation goes, uh, and they're the things I remember from primary school. Them three things. Uh, um, there's probably other things uh, like something like like having a conversation about the rain and say and ba- and basically how do you check if it's raining? Well, you look in a puddle, don't you? Uh, uh, but that that's then some things you remember from primary school. Now we've recently wrapped our Drop Everything and Read campaign. So here's a quick showcase of what that was all about. What a few weeks it has been here at Succeed with Dyslexia. It has been amazing seeing the different ways that many of us choose to drop everything and read. everything and read follow us to stay up to date on all of our future campaigns in our last segment we're going to hear from cassandra and some of the things that she's learned being a tutor for individuals with neurodiversities Hello everyone, welcome back to another Succeed with Dyslexia interview. We have been absolutely blessed with incredible people who have come and been interviewed on our Succeed with Dyslexia and we have done exactly the same again today. We have an, another incredible guest uh, and, and a really good friend of mine who is going to be uh, sharing kind of her uh, take on dyslexia and, and how it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, affected her, but but also as well um, what she's doing within the dyslexia world uh, as well. So I'm absolutely thrilled to, to have you if you wouldn't mind um just to introduce yourself and tell our viewers and our listeners a little bit of maybe your name that would be a good start uh, and a little bit about yourself that that would be wonderful and thank you again for your time you're welcome thank you darren for giving me this platform it's really wonderful so hi my name's cassandra rollett may and i am a, a leader of the ceo i suppose of rollett ed education and i'm a private tutor consultant for students who find learning challenging so I was a primary school teacher so that's kind of my basis but my specialism is now working and supporting learners with dyslexia and who find learning challenging. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, at, at, for sharing that. So if you could just tell me, how does kind of, uh, what's your connection with, with dyslexia? As, as in, uh, you know, uh, were you diagnosed? What, what kind of age? How, how does that kind of, um, how does dyslexia um, work with you? In my life. Yeah, I can definitely do that. So I was really sure fortunate. I... <laughs> yeah. I was really fortunate because I'm in my 40s. So dyslexia when I was at primary school wasn't something that lots of people knew about. Um, but I went to a small um, private school. So I was really lucky with that. And the um, the principals of the school had done research and qualifications in dyslexia. So lots of students who went through the school, if their learning wasn't in line with their peers, kind of had an initial assessment and then were sent on to, um, to another organisation to be assessed if that was necessary. So I was kind of picked up really early on, formally diagnosed when I was eight. And in the primary school that I was in, I had individual support. So I didn't sit the 11 plus and was given and taken out of French and a couple of other lessons like that. So I was given one to one to work on specific programs, something like Alpha to Omega was one of the ones that I used. And there were specific reading books to build up my confidence and my skills. So I'm always eternally grateful for that um, because my parents had the more tricky side of it because they were told that dyslexia didn't really exist uh, at that time in the 80s. So I was given a great deal of support um, and that enabled me to, to move onwards. And my class sizes were quite small. And at one point, I would say a third of the class, nearly half the class maybe was dyslexic because they'd heard about the support being given by the school. So, you know, we were able to, to work together. So I did feel really fortunate. Um, and then um, throughout my academic sort of side, I've had my own tutors because learning was difficult at school. Um, and that's kind of what spurred me on to do what I do now. I think I wanted to be a teacher from the time I was about nine or 10 because I knew that I had been given that opportunity and I was really grateful and um, I wanted to help others like myself. Thank you for, again for sharing that. It, it, it's, it, you know, it's really uh, wonderful and heartwarming to, to hear. It, I guess that the other side, uh, you know, from what I've experienced in the sense of, you know, the, the support and, and when we take kind of diagnosis, for instance, and you say, you know, you was kind of formally diagnosed at eight, was it eight? Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned yes, that's, 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 you know, uh, you know, an age, I guess, where you can then still kind of develop and help and support, you know, the children. We're having, you know, more and more stories now, statistics of people being, you know, late diagnosis. I was 36, mm -hmm. which is, you know, in, in those circumstances, a very kind of late diagnosis. So I guess, you know, it, it must have been within school then with, with that support, a real kind of creative kind of environment or, you know, a real kind of supportive in environment. And, and I guess, was there any kind of subjects that you you struggled with within school that you can um, remember with yeah definitely my dyslexia kind of comes across in in the, the typical literacy side of it but also maths and processing and remembering was kind of my area so hence why I didn't get put through to the initial assessments because I could speak the things but I couldn't necessarily remember in time for a, a test so in primary school it was definitely really understood being creative looking at things differently it was was encouraged which was really super but it it was more to do with that taking out and doing that extra lessons as well um, but in secondary school there wasn't a great deal of support during my time and also because I wanted to learn you have that typical um, teachers thinking that obviously you can talk and you're interested in learning but then the work that you produce doesn't match so the, the teachers at the time really struggled to help me and understand and there wasn't a great deal of support then um, but I got through that system with with uh, with a with a personal private tutor and then I was able to go to college um, um, so I only sat up until GCSEs because I knew that I wouldn't be able to pass A-levels and um, then went to FE college and then I was able to get to university. So, again, I'm really grateful for the support during it. It wasn't an easy journey, um, but it's the it's the development of everybody working together and, and just having that end goal. But I do think what you're saying is really interesting because it's never too late to have a diagnosis, but it depends whether you need it or not. But the system that we work within means that if you slip through that net of diagnosis, your journey is, is a little bit more frustrating and troublesome. And that's kind of where I'm, I, 
where where you and I are supporting people now because if it is picked up in school and supported correctly then that's really great but sometimes uh, we have the older uh, you know the people of your your age and in, in between actually all ages and even older and it's not until their children might get diagnosed or even their grandchildren that they go oh wait that's in my my my, my family line as well and I think it so it's never too late and it definitely helps your well-being if you can attach sort of a neurodiversity understanding to to it but it's the strategies and the support you receive that is the bigger influence i think that brings us to the end of this episode we hope you enjoyed this video as much as we did putting it together now we have some more fantastic content for you please feel free to click this link here and view episode 13. you just watched episode 14 and yes we do come out with a new episode every single month in hopes of spreading more awareness about dyslexia if you have any comments or questions, leave them in the comments below. And once again, thank you so much for watching.